Good morning, everyone. So <clears throat> the chief and uh, Trustee Calandrell and I will try and speak up as much as we can. This microphone is only working for the video recording. So as, as we start to, uh, to do this and we kind of pan around, so you may find yourself on channel four if you ask a question. So just to give you a heads up on that one. So we, we have two main topics that we'd like to cover today. First will be uh, about how we in Orland Park are uh, pursuing public safety. And there's a, a number of things in there that we'd like to share with you all. And then we'll get some question and answer from you as well. And then we want to turn our attention specifically to things that affect seniors. And, and the chief will s tell you some of the things that we're seeing uh, through the police department where, you know, not so good actors not so good actors are targeting seniors. So we want to make sure that we kind of get that information out to you. And then uh, two other notes. If we have time, we will uh, spend a little bit on emergency response with events like we had last night in terms of the storms and the issue with the sirens and sirens, excuse me, and what to do. And probably the best bit of news is the chief has graciously asked the police department, which has power, to bring some coffee. So we will turn this into a, a senior coffee. All right. So, you know, with that, I, I've known Tim for a long time in my service uh, in the village, and he's been our chief of police for a very long time, but I think the, the best person to introduce him will be the chief. Tim? Oh. Well, uh, thank you, Jim. I think most of you can probably hear me uh, fairly well. I thought, Dan, you were going to make a couple comments uh, as well. But let me just speak uh, about the uh, many of the issues that specifically uh, affect senior citizens. I was going to do a little PowerPoint presentation and go over crime stats for 20 years because it's important to look at trends in crime and not just a snapshot, which doesn't hurt either. One of the most important issues for policing is violent crime. And our violent crime in Orland Park is very low. And I'm looking over 20 years, not 20 months, but 20 years. And we are required to report to the federal government every year eight categories of crime in Orland Park. It's called the Uniform Crime, crime Reporting. Every community in the country reports those. And they are the four violent crimes, or crimes against person, are murder, criminal sexual assault, robbery, and aggravated assault and battery. Those are the four crimes against person or violent crimes. Uh, the four crimes against property are burglary, theft, motor vehicle theft, and arson. Our violent crime rate is extremely low and has been going down. From a high of 52 violent crimes in 1994 to 17 last year. So it's remarkably low. Uh, crimes are reported per 10,000, and that's roughly, with 60,000 people, about three people per 10,000 that were the victim of a violent crime. That's pretty good odds. Now, five of those were criminal sexual assaults, which are very serious. All five of those, however, were relationship type sexual assaults. That is, one party might have been 18 and the other party 14, which is a crime in Illinois. And, many, and actually, I think three out of the five were children that were assaulted by an adult which is one of the worst crimes you could possibly have. Now, the other crimes are crimes against persons. And we have a lot of retail, uh, retail in Orland Park. And as John Dillinger said, why do you rob banks? He says, that's where the money is. So with our retail commercial area, we attract plenty of thieves. And our number one uh, type of crime is theft, and in particular, retail theft. And we had 1,246 last year, down almost 300 from a couple years before. So we're making inroads there. Now, some of the, now this also includes thefts, such as someone stealing a bike uh, off from someone's home, uh, someone stealing a lawn ornament. Some are rather minor. It's kind of odd that you're comparing thefts to murders, but uh, that's the way the report goes. But let's talk about what specifically affects seniors. And these are scams, ruses, things of that nature. You've probably heard in the past that you'll, people get a phone call. Your, your grandson or granddaughter was arrested in Canada or somewhere overseas, need to send money for bond to get them out, or they need money for medical emergencies, or it's the IRS calling 
uh, and they want money to avoid a tax lien or something like that. Any type you, you have some call like that that's questionable, call us. We can find out and let you know. One of the things that bothers me the most, we have a burglary or something takes place and we always canvass the neighborhood and someone might tell us, geez, yeah, I heard something at three in the morning and I didn't want to call because I didn't want to bother you. You're not bothering us. <laughs> We're out there 24 seven. Call us on anything that's suspicious. The one area that we're really concentrating on right now are ruse burglaries. But I want to talk about a couple things before I get to ruse burglaries and give you some information. Is first, burglary to motor vehicle. There's two crimes that affect you the most. Burglary to motor vehicle, and that is people stealing stuff out of your car. If we just lock our cars, most of that goes away. Most of it is done in your driveway, but when they do that, they can get your garage door opener out of there too. And right now, if I go outside here and check the cars, I think I'll find 10 or 20% that aren't locked. It's not like they're breaking into the cars or breaking the windows to get in. It's just opening the car door, grabbing the change, CDs, GPS, and electronics. So if we just lock our cars, even when they're in the garage, we tend to leave our garage doors open. I have the police coming by my house regularly because I'm one of those, I forget to close my garage door from time to time. And they'll call me at four in the morning, Chief, your garage door is open again. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm the worst offender. And, but our cars are locked, but the door into the house isn't. Uh, but let's lock up. Lock up the cars, lock up the doors in your garage, and we reduce crime dramatically. Now, the one that bothers me the most, and the one I want to concentrate on, is the ruse burglaries. And people that come to your house soliciting, which is part of this. First of all, we have a soliciting ordinance that's great. It's a good ordinance. When people want to solicit in Orland Park, they apply through the village manager's office. They want to solicit uh, for windows, roofs. And there's a lot of them out there now. There's companies that actually chase the storms regularly and come into towns, they're, fair, they're legitimate, uh, and look for roof damage and tell you what your insurance company is going to pay for it. But before they do that, they have to apply. They send the application to the police department, and we do a background on the company, including checking the Better Business Bureau, lawsuits against the company, name check the individuals who will be soliciting. If they pass that, and typically most do, we give them a badge to wear, which they must have on. And they look like this. Yeah, I will pass one this way and one that way. And they must have these on. There's only two exceptions for political reasons, you know, when they come around collecting signatures and passing out literature and for religious purposes. But for any commercial use, they have to have one of those on. And if they don't, you call the police. Ask for it. They, sometimes they put it on their sleeve and it's a little bit hard to see but they have to have that on. If they don't, get them off your property, call the police. If you see a license plate number, get it and let us know. We ticket them. Oftentimes, if they're, we see oftentimes they're selling candy and products like that. We confiscate it, because oftentimes, as you can imagine, the candy is two years old. Uh, and oftentimes, they, kids are abused and used to go around and sell candy, it's almost like child slavery, and they take them from one neighborhood to the next. So we try to do a thorough investigation of those. But I bring out the solicitation because they're supposed to wear those things. And what we have seen, we put out a lot of information, I'm gonna pass some more out here, are the ruse burglaries. The ruse burglaries are when someone comes to your house and they attempt to get into your home saying that you had a water problem. We're here with the county, we're here with the state, we're here with ComEd, we're here from the village. And we need to go into your backyard and check on some type of, of strange issue that you probably never heard of before. Or your roof had some damage. While you're distracted, someone else goes in the house and rifles through your property to take jewelry, cash, and any other valuables and out the door. Last year we had 15 of these. Eight were successful. The month they hit, we know the times, it's between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. almost regularly between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. The, the three top days are Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. And they wait for you to be outside. They look for people outside during the day, doing their gardening, cleaning up their property, and that's the people they go after. Now, we've been putting out 
a lot of police Monday, Tuesdays, and Fridays going after these people. They look Hispanic, but they're not. In most cases, uh, they're Eastern European, Romania, places like that, sometimes referred to as gypsies. Uh, and they're well organized. They've been doing it for years. We've caught several of them. And have, uh, several are in jail now on uh, three and a half million dollar bonds. Uh, so the judges have been very cooperative when we catch them. We've also had two this year where because of the information we put out, our residents recognized it, neighbors recognized it, and they said we're calling the police and they skedaddled pretty quick. Uh, we've gone to the extent to even put up a couple cameras in different locations around the village on major roads because we know they come from the north and they come from the east. So we put up some cameras, so if we have one we can check those. We have license plate numbers of those that uh, uh, we are aware of. But July is the number one month for them to hit. It's this month and we'll be out, have plenty of people out both in uh, undercover vehicles and marked police cars. It's largely east of LaGrange Road are beats one, three, five, and four. It's largely east of LaGrange Road, but they hit out in Eagle Ridge some time ago. We've identified the offender, and the person has uh, kind of taken off and is in the wind at the moment. But if they're gone altogether, that helps us uh, as well. We work with the Illinois State Police on a task force, since this is not an Orland Park issue. This is a, uh, a na national issue which I'm not so much worried about. I'm worried about Orland Park, but certainly it's a regional <coughs> issue uh, for sure. I want to pass these out. Uh, if we could pass some, I, I was going to make more, but power is out. Uh, if you could pass those around to the tables, and it'll give you an idea of the MO of these people. But they're successful. They know what they're doing. They've been doing it for years, and it's not going to end until we have arrested all of them. And there's plenty of them out there. Uh, but the ruse burglary is the number one problem, in our view, for senior citizens right now. You're outside, you're tending to your property, you're taking care of your flowers, your lawn, the outside of your home, washing windows, cleaning your cars, and so forth, and they look for people like that. Our officers are going up when we see people outside, particularly between two and four, giving them the same flyer, telling them that this could happen, and uh, we put it in every media source that we can possibly think of, and we need for you to pass this around to your friends and neighbors, and please, we would rather have 10 calls for service uh, that turn out to be uh, in, in unfounded. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. And have that 11th one and we catch one of these people because we catch them doing one and you know they've done a lot more. You know they've done a lot more. Any questions about that? Have you heard about the ruse burglaries before? Yes. Great. That's really important to us. They've heard about it before and the more information about it. But you are their target. Me too, by the way. <laughs> uh, we are the targets for these people, plain and simple. And when you're out there two to four, Monday through Friday, rarely on Saturday, you know, over five years of data, I think it's happened once on Saturday, male and female. We had a female involved in this for the first time in about five years, so it's male and female uh, who are um, committing these acts. If we can stop this ruse burglary, we, we stop a crime wave not only in Orland Park, uh, but all over the uh, metropolitan area. Any questions about that? Yes, sir. Would you call 911 or would you call the... Call, call 911. You know, we don't mind. 911 and the uh, 411 generally go to the same place, uh, to our dispatch center, but we have one person that handles the non-emergency and two that handle the 911. It, all it does is it goes from 411 to 911, they transfer the call. But anything in progress, like if, if you're ever, ever in doubt, it's 911. It, it's 911. And our response time is just over two minutes. Over the years, I've seen uh, cars or vans dropping off kids, and the kids are selling cans. That's it. But I never see the kids wear any kind of identification. Are they supposed to? And if they aren't, are they to be reported? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Anyone soliciting in Orland Park, except for religious and political purposes, have to be screened by the police department and they have to have those badges on. And we get calls and we ticket them, we take the, the, uh, the candy and things as evidence, and then we try to do an investigation to find out who, who, who sent you here. Because as you point out, they're teenagers and sometimes even younger. Yeah, I've seen them even younger, but I don't know where they're coming from. I see them sometimes being dropped off and then, you know, they're going from house to house. Yeah, call us, we'll find that out. 
and we find out who dropped them off, what time they're supposed to get picked up, and we take the money, we take the candy, we inventory it, and we write them tickets. We're looking to, we're really going after the adults that are sending them there more than the kids. Writing a kid a ticket who is being abused already doesn't mean a whole lot, but we want to stop this thing once and for all. Yeah, so please call. They must have that tag on that you're seeing passed around. So if we get those calls on the kids, and just as importantly, these rules, anyone that comes to your house, you know, that's what we want. And they're out there now regularly, and people are calling us on roof damage. But there are, believe it or not, legitimate companies that follow the storms. They follow the storms around the country, and they go out and solicit for legitimate companies in the area. But they still must have the uh, solicitor's badge on them at all times. And they still must be cleared by us, and sometimes they're not. I mean, I get people come to my house for windows, no badge, as they get off the property. Uh, police are coming, because so I'll call and hold them until the police come. You can't do this. And if they're adults, they do get a ticket, for sure. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. A couple months ago, I kept getting phone calls from um, so-called the police department soliciting money. And I said to him, I happen to know the police don't solicit on the telephone because my husband was a policeman in the city. The, the, and as soon as he heard that, he heard. The police department, the Orland Park Police Department. Did everybody hear the question? Did everybody hear the question? No. The, yeah. the question was getting phone calls allegedly from police departments soliciting for funds. And it happens regularly. The Orland Park Police Department has never solicited for funds. Now, the FOPs and other groups do, uh, Fraternal Order of Police and different groups, they do call and solicit for funds. And oftentimes, they will represent as if they are the Orland Park Police Department or the Cook County Sheriff's Department or the Illinois State Police. They are not. Uh, now, they are soliciting for their lodge or for you know, their organizations, and of course they can do that, but they can't represent themselves as the police, and that's police impersonation. We have taken some action on that when we actually can track it down. But uh, uh, our recommendation is that you never respond to a solicitation over the telephone, ever. Uh, you just don't know. I don't care if it's for police, um, I don't care what it's for, that you never respond to a solicitation over the telephone. And, yes, ma'am. You know that line you just said, somebody called me, he said, this is a police, we're soliciting. He said, don't send your uh, donation, I'll come pick it up. No, come right to the... I said, I know somebody, uh, somebody in the police department, I'll call them first. Yes. And they said, I talked to your supervisor, one of the supervisors, I know him, Kinsella. Yes. He said... That is a police, but we have nothing to do with it. And that's absolutely correct. They are police organizations, but they're not police departments. And they're soliciting for funds for whatever their interests are to lobby for different things. Uh, he said he will come pick it up. I said, no, you're not coming. That's right. And they will. And they'll be there in 10 minutes, by the way. Yeah, I know. Where he said, oh, well, I could come to your house and get this donation. Yes. I go, no, you're not. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> now you can put a sign on your door, no solicitors, you know, and they have to honor that as part of our ordinance. If you want to put on a door, yeah, but we can, if we can write them a ticket for that too. Any other questions? Any other, not related to Ruse burglary or anything else? I think there's a couple, uh, a couple examples that, uh, I'm a Cook County State's Attorney, that's my day job, so hopefully you guys can hear me, I'm usually in court, so no one say objection, so I don't get freaked out, okay? But, uh, so, in the State's Attorney's Office, we get a lot of these, it's a countywide, statewide, nationwide issue. The examples are, they come in, they, they uh, say that the utility workers, and there's a, a line in back, and as you're going in the back, uh, walking them, there's two people going inside your home. Uh, another, uh, speaking of over the telephone, a lot of the um, new scams are uh, your niece, your nephews calling or your grandchildren are calling, saying, "I need m money wired to me because I'm uh, locked up somewhere else." Uh, don't do that. Of course, call the mom that you you know your uh, pa uh, the parents or whatnot. Do not wire in money when if someone says they're your you know your nephew, your grandchild are uh, are locked up and need money right right away, and it's uh, in probably a foreign place too. So it's going to be when they come to your house. It's going to be utility workers. It's going to be um, solicitors for any uh, other purposes, and they're going to look. They're going to be clean cut. They're not going to be 
riffraff. They're going to be clean. They're going to look professional, and they're professional st stealers, robbers. They're going to rob you, and they're going to and and they're going to take everything. So that's the key thing: is making sure when someone comes to the door, utility worker, make sure the identification. Um, I'm sure there's hi highlights on your sheet too, Tim. But those are the key things. I think I'm trying to think of another example, and uh, this one happened in. Uh, uh, Oakland, but I can't think of the exact example. It was a utility worker and stuff like that. So just make sure you know who's at your front door. And if you don't know them, don't open that door and call the police. Um, also, uh, like Tim said, when in doubt, call 911. And furthermore, you, whenever you do see suspicious activity, get the license plate number, get the make of the car, you know, uh, just make sure you remember that information because then Tim will get it and then they'll get on the street with all their officers. All right, so, so uh, Tim, thanks. We're going to call Tim back up in, in, in a second, but I wanted to kind of more formally introduce Trustee uh, Calandrello. As, as he mentioned, he is a uh, assistant state's attorney, so he's got an interesting perspective on how this works, both as the chairman of our public safety committee, and I'm going to call him back up in a second to talk through some of those issues, and he works closely with Tim and the rest of the board here. Yeah, to, to make sure that we put the right All investment. Right. So before... So one more time, thank you to the chief and the police department for bringing the coffee. So a little emergency response there. <laughs> what we'd like to do now for, for the next couple of minutes is I'm going to bring back up Trusty Calandrello, who I serve with on the village board. And as he mentioned, he is an assistant uh, state's attorney. So he kind of sees the other side of law enforcement, which is a pretty important piece here. Tim and the department do a great job at catching the bad guys. And then it kind of goes down to the county and a whole different cycle starts. But Trusty Calandrello brings a great perspective to his role as the chairman of the Public Safety Committee. And so we're going to call him up here for a couple minutes to talk about how the board committees and the village board work and how we support investments in public safety, and then we'll have some, some Q&A, but also, uh, it, it's, it's horrible to admit this, but the nation has uh, an emerging, if not continuing, drug problem. So between Trusty Calandrello and Tim, you'll hear how that impacts a lot of things that, that we do. So I'd like to reintroduce Trusty Calandrello. Okay. <clears throat> so first of all, I can, as a state's attorney, I can say this wholeheartedly that we have the best police force in the area, in Cook County. I guarantee you that. And that's Tim, definitely. So, uh, most professional, always on time. When we have the case, we know it's going to be a good one. It's not going to be one that's going to be a, a dismissal right away. Um, we know that they're, they're on time, that and we pay them for that. But, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, that's another investment. But I just want to tell you that. I, I can wholeheartedly say, tell, tell you all that, that I see all of them from the from all over the place, and I wonder uh, if anyone has a, an officer, family member, and from a different department, I want to uh, say anything bad about that, but I can tell you Orland Park has the best police force in the county. So what does the Village Board do? Like I said, it's a big, we have a big budget, and we have to help Tim out a lot with um, his staffing issues, because it's a big village. Um, we have roughly budgeted about 100 officers, However, there's a lot of retirees and stuff like that, which is always a, a venture for Tim and the board to make sure that we have the officers on the street. But a couple of cool programs, or good programs I want to bring to your attention is our crime-free housing, which a program we started a couple years ago. Uh, a couple years ago, the crime-free programming, uh, which helps out uh, to reduce crime in uh, some of the rental uh, properties we have by having backgrounds and, and uh, issues like that. Second of all, which I, th I think Tim will uh, talk about, address a little bit before, is a retail detail, which I'm sure if you guys were in the mall this year, you can definitely see a bigger presence of Orland Park officers there, um, and that's a big detail, that there's walk in the streets, walk in the malls, uh, making sure the presence is there, because I, in my profession, you can't stop all crimes, but what stops a lot of crimes is scaring off the criminals by having a police presence at the malls, and the streets, so when... Uh, Criminals are, are not uh, very intelligent. They want to find an easy pick, and that's why it's good to have police on the street. And then uh, to segue to the second kind of thing that uh, Trustee Dodge talked about is the crime, uh, uh, is the drug issue. Nationwide, uh, in city of Chicago, it's definitely a drug issue, as you probably hear every day about uh, a lot, lot of our young people are getting into um, uh, cocaine or getting, you know, they're going to the west side of the city, they're bringing it back here. Um, a couple of things that I think is great that Tim's doing and the village is supporting that is ha getting out to the schools and touching base with them. We, 
Tim, uh, I want to say probably 15, 20 years ago, started the D.A.R.E. program with uh, now Mayor McLaughlin, who was trustee back there, and now they're doing a booster to talk about drugs, too. So they, they hit them young about the, the effects of uh, alcohol and, not, and drugs, and they hit them harder uh, in high school, right? High school? Eighth grade. Eighth grade. So when they're a little bit older, when they start to reach that. Because by eighth grade, kids now are adults. You know, uh, people have to, the kids have to mature, are maturing quicker than myself or any, any of us. But wh the cool thing is, is that, Tim, that we're taking that serious with the drug academic. We're making sure that we're helping. We actually go in and help some of the city sometime and follow where our, our sources are and make sure that uh, we stop them. Second of all, our officer safety we have to look at too because now more people have need needles. In their, in their pockets and stuff like that. So, and that's officer safety issue that we just approved, I want to say about a month ago, uh, special gloves. So when, heaven forbid, there is a needle in someone's pocket, uh, our officers won't get diseases and stuff like that. And furthermore, uh, one thing that we actually just approved, I want to say last week or two weeks ago, is the Narcan, which what it is, um, it's, it's a nasal spray. I don't know, is it a needle? Oh, it's an injection, just like a, um, a be, uh, EpiPen. So when, and, and most times, police are the first, pe first ones to arrive. Ambulances are there a couple, couple minutes later. You have a child or someone ODing on drugs. What they do is take it out, stick it in, and uh, it, it, it gets it out and quicker. Um, so, you know, at least the first stages of the initial body reaction is out of the way and we can save a life or two. So I think that's a great investment that we did. And like I said, and, and all these things that we're talking about, the retail detail, the crime of free housing, and uh, all the um, try, trying to help out with the drug problem is forward looking. We're not trying, to, we're not seeing a problem and sitting on our hands. We're actually trying to be aggressive in our law enforcement, which again, I think is a site to Tim and the Village Board where we can't just stop, we do, you know, we're doing well, we're doing really well right now, but we can't just stop and say, okay, we're going to rest on our morals. So I think that's the key thing that we have to look at, is that as a village, as a police department, we're forward looking, we're being aggressive in our crime enforcement, in all different teams, you know, in the retail, in the, in the drug enforcement, and everything else. So. Thanks. Uh, well, I was about to call him Dan. We're pretty used to using uh, first names on the village board, so you know, we can call him Dan, we can call him Tim, so we're all pretty, pretty, pretty comfortable here. So just a couple of comments before we, we, we shift topics just a little bit uh, towards technology. So to underscore some of what, uh, what Dan just talked about, think about what it's like to be a, a cop these days, right? You think about what you're dealing with, you know, as you see continued breakdown in society, all the stuff that they're confronted with, which is one of the reasons why, as a, bro a village board, we're going to continue to make smart investments in police to keep Orland Park safe. That's one of our key priorities, and that's one of the things that we've heard repeatedly from folks across all age spectrums in the village, that you want a strong police force because we want to keep our community safe. And, and Tim you know, brings a lot of the uh, insights around law enforcement to us so that we have to make an investment. I mean, think about what we have to do. We have to invest so that we've got this Narcan, which kind of reduces the effects of narcotics because, unfortunately, Society breaks down more, people have drug problems, it's our cops on the front line kind of having to respond to it. So it's an unfortunate fact of life these days. And, you know, as we see it from the village board perspective, you know, a lot of times people that uh, they just, you know, the kids dress differently these days than, than we all used to in our, our, our various age ranges. So, you know, you got to be mindful of how we approach this and how we communicate to the, to the broader uh, society as well as Orland, this is what we're doing to keep our town safe. So it's kind of important. But two things, and we'll, we'll shift to technology. One, now that you've heard this discussion about ruse burglaries and the phone scams, definitely call. I want to emphasize it again and again and again, right? Call the police department or call the village, either 411 or 911. We'd rather have you be safe than sorry, so if there's ever any issue, let the professionals quickly get to the bottom when it comes to, is it a kid doing something legitimate because they've got a band fundraiser, or is it something a little bit more, I don't know, untowards is the word I'll use, where it's part of a commercial operation and these kids are not in the right place. Let, let our police department take care of it. So pick up the phone. If you see something suspicious in the least, call the police department. They're professionals. They'll deal with it. And um, talk to your neighbors. Talk to your friends and your neighbors. The best thing that we have going for us as a community is people being smarter and more people being smarter so you're talking about it. So if you have a neighbor 
that's not here, let him or her know similar types of things. So it's really important that you bring this to us. Now, shifting to the technology side. <laughs> Technology's good, sort of, right? Yeah, so, so shifting to technology, and we'll kind of start the conversation this way, and then we'd like to open it up for just any question you want to throw at us, either Dan or I from the Village Board or the Chief on Public Safety. We've talked about internally as a board and with the Chief how to give the police department the best possible technology to make their job easier. And one of the things uh, that I want to put on the table, and then we'll have the Chief come back up, is every time you make a phone call, to the village, I think I see this, or I'm not sure what this is, they keep track of that information. So the way Tim, Tim told you, it's Monday, Tuesdays, Fridays, apparently they might have a part-time job so they don't do it on Saturdays and never before 9 a.m. kind of thing. Well, how would you know that? The only way we know that is because the police department is looking at the information. A lot of the information we have that we can leverage for the right enforcement comes from you when you make the phone calls. So there's a linkage here, and it's a, and it's a circle that we want to keep connected. So call, and then you know, with, with that, Tim, I'm going to call you back up and talk about sort of how you use our current technology, and then sort of what's on the horizon that we as a board and a community, because we're you guys give us the dollars with what you spend at the mall and your property tax. We're trying to make the smart decisions so that we're all a, a safer community. So Tim, we'll call you back up for this. Thanks, James. Uh, well, first, the, the mayor and the board are, are very cognizant of the public safety needs uh, of the village, and they rarely turn me down, uh, but I ask every year, and occasionally uh, they have to say no. But uh, they rarely do, and they're number one, without a doubt. I mean, I've been here 20 years, and frankly, I wouldn't have stayed if it was anything other than their number one um, priority is public safety. And so they, they take it... <laughs> Uh, I get plenty of calls from them about what happened here and how did this happen and so on. How do we how do we make it better? They don't tell me how to do my job. They ask me how they can support the police department to do a better job. Uh, the, the police department, our police department, has been ahead of the curve in, in, in technology even before I got here. Uh, we use computer aided dispatch. It's commonly called CAD, and it's okay to use it. But what it does do it just gathers information. When every time there's an incident at a location it goes under that address. So when an officer is on his way there, he'll know there were three or four or five other incidents there. It's important to have that knowledge. If you want to give us information that you have guns in your home, we can put that in there so an officer knows on his way. If, if for some reason someone calls and say they're breaking into that house, we would have that information. Health issues, we take that too. We refer those largely to the fire department so they ha have that information. So all this historical information is, is very important. Um, Trustee Calandrello mentioned a little bit about crime-free rental housing. Uh, history shows us that there's more crime in rental property. It's a fact of life. So not, uh, it happens. We now have a very strong ordinance that we use to require the owners of property to evict those people who become a problem. And that means if we go there three times for different criminal or quasi-criminal type of events, they have to begin the eviction process. And if they don't, we start finding them and go after them. But it's all based upon information in our CAD system, our computer-aided dispatch system. It's been very successful. Every year, 10, 11 families, gone. Now, we don't feel good about it, but on the same token, if you have a, a rental, six people in a, in a building, one, of, one dysfunctional group can destroy a whole building and then a whole neighborhood. It's called the broken windows theory of policing that you better address the small stuff because if you ignore those forever, they all of a sudden are, are the big stuff. So you address the small stuff as well. And we have an inspector by the name of Tom Lynch who handles the backgrounds for solicitors that handles our crime-free rental housing program and is, is very successful in rooting out those groups that uh, are coming here for no other reason than to disrupt communities. I went to a home, you, you might know where it's at, at 135th and LaGrange, it sits back on the west side of the street. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's, it's across from Southmore. And a, a number of kids, well, young adults, they weren't kids, 20, 21 years old, we had arrested them one time before for trying to break into one of our train stations with Dad. And they, they were from a different suburb. They moved in there. There's homes just to the, the north of it. And they were raising heck back there, you know, with cars. It's a big lot. It's like three acres. So I went out to see him, 
And I said, I'm going to tell you something. You keep it up and you're going to be out of here. Well, they scoffed at it a little bit. And I said, every chance we get, we're going to arrest you. Our whole, only goal in life is going to be to arrest you and make your life miserable. And I said, and to throw you out of here. And fortunately, they had two more events. The landlord wasn't cooperative initially, but when he had several thousand dollars worth of tickets, he got his mind right, and he evicted these <laughs> jerks. Now, maybe we're sending them on to some other community, unfortunately, but we've also formed the Southwest Landlords Association between Tinley Park, Orland Park, and Oak Forest, and they meet twice a year to talk about different rental issues, and we let them know who has been evicted. It's a public record anyway, so that they don't end up in apartments in another location. Uh, camera technology. We have cameras in all of our police cars, and, and for good reason. It's for the protection of our officers, it's to record crimes, to be more successful prosecuting people as a result of, of uh, having video recordings, and Trustee Calandrello can say how important they are, uh, excuse me, to have uh, videotape of incidents that take place. I mentioned in regards to the um, ruse burglaries, that we are now putting up cameras at some specific locations where we think these people come into town. And we put one up, I'll tell you where it's at, 135th and Pawnee is one of them, facing eastbound on 135th Street, and we're capturing license plates. And we want to think the neighbors came out, our people were putting it up on a hot date or sweating, and brought out water for them and everything else, told them exactly what it was for. Uh, we're not trying, and what we, with the camera you have, the only thing you can see is the license plate driver of the car too, but it doesn't come out, but we're going to get better cameras and everything else is, is obliterated. So it's not like you're looking into someone's home or anything else like that and it's facing 135th Street. But we have to use technology more because police are expensive in this day and age. The equipment is expensive. The training is expensive uh, for police and we're mandated to do a tremendous amount of training. So we have to use technology and I'm happy to tell you that we're put, putting those cam cameras up. Uh, uh, we're not going to hide anything about it, let people know and let the bad guys know too uh, <laughs> that we're capturing their license plates because we know their plates on many of their cars and we can be, uh, we're going to take it to the next level. We'll be notified when that plate goes through that location. And if it happens at 2 in the morning, or in the case of our, our ruse burglaries, between 2 and 4 o'clock, we're going to flood that area with police cars. And the same at 2 o'clock in the morning, if we have a plate number of a person who's a known burglar or a known felon, we get automatic notification. We want to know why they're out there at 2 or 4 in the morning. And I'm not out there at 2 or 4 in the morning. So technology is, is, is very important to us. Uh, our police cars, we know they're, where they're at every moment because we have vehicle locator systems in them and we can go back and take a look at every place they were the speed they were going at any time of the day or night and occasionally we'll get a call that our police car was here our police car was there and we said come on we'll take a look sometimes they're right <laughs> they're exactly right and sometimes it's another police department uh, so all of that is important uh, to maintain the integrity of your police force too. Because with 100 police officers, and we have nine part-time police officers too, from time to time, like any other big organization, we make mistakes. Now, it's important to point out when we get citizen complaints, and we do get them, uh, only about 20 a year, believe it or not, it, it's very low. Uh, many of those are from someone who got a, a traffic ticket, they weren't happy about it, and they'll come in, and the number one complaint is rude and abusive behavior. And we said, well, come on in and take a look at the videotape. Well, no, I really don't want to get involved <laughs> uh, because it wasn't. But on other occasions, our officers will lose their patience and say something they shouldn't have said. And they'll pay the price for it if they did it. So we make mistakes just like everyone else, uh, but we have the technology in place to address that as well. And that's important, the integrity of your police department. Without that, uh, the, if you don't have the confidence of your citizens, uh, you won't get the cooperation either. But we have a large budget. It's over $19 million uh, for the police department. Uh, but I hope uh, it's well spent. I hope you think it's well spent. Uh, we're well funded. We're well equipped. Uh, most of the technology we've asked for, we've gotten. Just recently, we asked for Narcan, which is the drug that counteracts uh, heroin overdose, opiate and heroin overdoses. But the other part of it, and even some of my officers, Chief, what we're, the, the, our colleagues in the police department have been doing this for years, saving people. We generally get there before them. If we can save a life, it might be, you know, people say, oh, they're, they're heroin addicts. Well, some are, without a doubt, and they've done it five or six times before, but someone's, they're someone's son or daughter, 
and they're, you know, they're still worth saving. And sometimes it's prescription drugs. These kids get into them either by mistake or on purpose from time to time and think that all prescription drugs that we, ha that we have in our cabinets are safe and they can use them too. And it will uh, counteract those type of, uh, of overdoses as well. So I think it's important we do it. It wasn't all that expensive. The training uh, was a little more complicated, but now the officers will have them in the car. AEDs, the automated external defibrillators, we're all trained in those and our officers have those in the car as well. So we have had numerous saves over the years using that technology. And if you've seen AEDs, uh, the first ones we bought required a little bit more, um, a little more intricate to make sure you got the paddles on correctly. And now it's almost anyone can do it without almost any training at all to pull an AED off the wall, press the button, listen to the instructions, and the, the device will give the shock if, in fact, it is needed. So we, we use taser technology. You've heard of tasers, and uh, our officers are all equipped with tasers. But what has it done? I know there's controversy every now and again over them. It's pretty rare in their, uh, that they harm anyone. And usually, if it is, it's because they're acute overdoses of drugs and things of that nature. But it saved a great number of injuries both to our officers and to the offender because there's little or no side effect from the use of a taser. It is technology when used properly. And the tasers, they have a computer inside them. So you can only give them the pre-measured dose of the uh, charge that it has. And it comes out on a computer printout. We print it out after every use of them take a look at it to make sure the officer used it uh, with, within the proper protocol. So technology helps us. Having the officers injured, as I was telling uh, Trustee Calandrello, uh, right now we're in a little bit of a bind for police officers. They had six retirements in the last couple of months. That's pretty unusual, but it was, you know, 30 years ago and there was a, a number that were hired. We support our military and I have three officers gone in the military. We have plenty of women police officers and they're having some babies, God bless them. So, <laughs> so we're not putting them out on the street, uh, but they have work they can do in the station, but we have to fill those beat cars as well. And we have officers injured. All of those things affect, affects our staffing and, and leads to overtime, <laughs> leads to overtime. But uh, we're gonna fill our beats and we're gonna have our minimums and our response time, we're not gonna let that suffer no matter what it takes. So I think we've given you a little bit of rundown about the police department, but uh, did we wanna take, did you want to mention about the tornadoes, the sirens? There? Yeah, so, so, so uh, we'll, we'll come back for a couple of uh, just sort of open microphone, have some questions. But uh, last night was a, uh, anybody miss the storm? Sleep right through it? Anybody? I, I, I have an eight-year-old son, and so we had to do the tornado drill that he learned at school. So the flashlights in the basement, the, the whole shot. But it, it was, and, and we, we've had a lot of folks chattering on social media sites, you know, Twitter and Facebook and, and all that about why the sirens didn't go off in Orland Park last night, and you could hear some other suburbs who did. So we've already started talking about it as a board and our, our, our first response folks. So I wanna have Tim come back up for just a second and explain how we approach this and then, quite frankly, at that point, we'd like to have an open, we'd like to hear from you, right? This is as much about us listening to you as, as anything. So we're gonna have Tim come back up and talk about the policies we have in place and probably a couple things you didn't know that we do in the background that we want to share because we're thinking it might be helpful to explain what you guys are about to hear sort of first, what we're doing to the whole village because Tim will tell you, if you put them on, you get phone calls. If you don't put them on, you get twice as many phone calls. So we'll, we'll talk you through that dilemma. Yep. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, more technology. There are, the, the Village of Orland Park, we follow the county protocol for emergency management in the use of sirens. And there's three reasons to activate the sirens. Now, before we get to that, when we have a severe weather storm coming, we have weather spotters. Every police officer in the village is trained as a weather spotter to know a rolling, uh, a rolling wall cloud from a tornado. So they're all, every, each and every one is trained as a weather spotter. When we have severe weather coming, and it was we all, every, nowadays it's no surprise when severe weather comes through, we move weather spotters out west of the village limits, west of Will Cook Road, to be spotting. Because we, as we all know, our severe weather generally comes from the southwest. Having done that, we have those people out there. There are three reasons to set off the sirens. I've been here 20 years, and, and we followed the protocol. 
And I can tell you in 20 years, no one's been injured one way or the other because we haven't been hit either. Um, trees have been knocked down. Uh, that's okay. That's not okay, but it's a tree. Uh, they can be replaced. But there's three reasons in the protocol to set off the sirens. Number one, if a trained weather spotter sees a, a spots a tornado within five miles of the village limits of Orland Park. Uh, number two, severe stru uh, structural damage, not trees, damaged by severe winds within five miles of the village of Orland Park, or of course in the village of Orland Park. And number three, the National Weather Service advising us that Orland Park is in the path of a confirmed tornado, not not just the conditions right for a tornado. So when we have severe weather, we open up what we call an operations center. We have a supervisor in there, usually as an assistant, and we're uh, noting all the roads that are being closed, where power lines come down, that we notified people, that we have barricades out, uh, whatever needs to be done. And he was up, and I was talking to him through the night. Well, it actually, this thing was over in about two hours. And uh, I said, Tom, are you seeing the conditions? He says, Chief, I'm not seeing them. And he's, uh, now Tilly Park set their sirens off. Some other places, and we contact, when we set ours off, we have to contact, uh, we contact surrounding municipalities. So we called and checked with some, and they said, better to be safe than sorry. There's, that's a two-edged sword. That's a two-edged sword. Uh, first of all, we had no tornadoes hit Orland Park. So what we did was right in, in that respect. Setting them off for other reasons, as soon as we set those off, it generates hundreds and hundreds of calls to the 911 system, why is setting the sirens off? Which now, when people call in, you know, we, we only have so many operators and so many lines, there's only eight 911 lines, they're filled up, okay? And people can't get through, but they're gonna call and ask why. We quickly, we do a tape recording, we switch it to them, listen to the National Weather Service, um, so that we're not tying up people. So we follow the policy strictly. It's, been, it's worked for us. By, by following it strictly. And we don't want to set the sirens off and then we have people calling, well, you woke me up at three o'clock in the morning, by the way, and nothing happened. Well, thank goodness nothing happened, of course, but so we get it both ways. Our code red, another piece of technology that we use from time to time, when we have some, you might get a call every now and again about some activity in some place in the village. And sometimes, uh, it was last year or year before we had a carjacking and the person we were tracking, we caught one, we're tracking the other one in the middle of the night going southwest through forest preserves and then into neighborhoods. So we have to do a code red, even though it's three, three o'clock in the morning, we did. And 70% yeah, of the people said it was great and 30% said never call me again. <laughs> and, uh, so sometimes uh, uh, you can't win either way, but that's okay. Uh, our policy, we follow the county policy, we think it's solid, and we think over 20 years it's been right. We haven't been wrong, but uh, uh, that's our policy, and for the time being, that's what we're gonna stick to. Yes, ma'am. Uh, on TV, I saw that Orland Park was getting, got a, a tornado was gonna hit Orland Park sure. last night. The question. My daughter, I didn't hear the sirens. My daughter called me and she said, Mom, get in the basement. My daughter called to me. And so I wondered why the sirens didn't go off. Because it wasn't confirmed. It wasn't confirmed by a trained weather spotter and not by the National Weather Service. And we get calls fairly regularly. I saw something here, I saw something there, and we, we can't confirm. Weather Channel doesn't make it confirmed. And, yeah, and tornado, the young lady just said it correct. It's a, it's a warning, not a sighting. A warning that Orland Park, South Cook County, could be in it, uh, the conditions are right for a tornado. No, because no, the tornado warnings come on very regularly, and they'll say, pardon me? No, it, there was no confirmed sighting, and there hasn't been, of a tornado as a result of that storm last night. And we want confirmation if we can get it, or if the National Weather Service, who has the best radar, says something's coming our way, then we'll, we'll set off the sirens. But there was nothing confirmed and nothing from the National Weather Service, though there was tornado warnings and watches all evening. But we want some confirmation before we do it. It's not like we're timid to set them off. We will set them off on the same token. There's a lot of consequences when you do set them off and consequences when you don't. We got the warning on our cell phone, which is uh, so that's really nice. That, yeah. That's good. But I mean, and of course, we're all responsible for our own safety, too, that if, if you, you feel endangered, it doesn't mean you can't go down to the basement and, and take precautions. Uh, that's fine. I mean, there's a lot of information out there that we should all have 
emergency food and water and so forth because uh, you bring up emergencies and, and working with the fire department, we're responsible, responsible for emergency management. And the theory is the first 72 hours of an emergency, like Washington where the tornadoes did hit, the first 72 hours you're gonna be on your own. That's gonna take that long to, to, for emergency management to uh, gear up because all of our equipment will be destroyed too. Well, I've always heard that if there's a watch, that means the conditions are right for a tornado. If there's a warning that a tornado has been sighted in your path and that's coming towards you, is that not right? No. Uh, what we get, we get tornado warnings all the time that a tornado could appear, conditions are right. No, that's a watch. I, no, but we, the, the, the media doesn't really, when they put it on, they're not using any specific terms for what, for what they're putting in the media. And the fact of the matter is the protocol was right. There was no tornadoes. So they were wrong by putting that out. They were wrong. And you know how they heighten our awareness very much with the snow. We, how many snowstorms have we seen? <laughs> they say there's going to be three inches of snow and they want us to uh, uh, head to Florida. <laughs> but uh, there, if, if, when we're in doubt, we'll set them off. That's, that's not a problem. When we're in doubt, we will set them off. But we didn't seem to be in doubt. I was in contact with them. And, um, uh, there wasn't anything, thank goodness. There wasn't anything. But it, uh, it, 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 it's certainly not an exact science either. You're absolutely right. It's not an exact science. Anything else? Yes, I have a question. Where is the Sarah located? We have uh, 11 of them throughout the village. Where's the nearest one here? Uh, the nearest one here. No. I don't think... No, I, I think that's uh, a lightning... Uh, I can tell you where a number of them are at. There's one right in Eagle Ridge Park. Uh, that's a big one that's out there. Um, I can't, I, I, don't, I have the list of where they're all at, but I, I don't remember off the top of my head. There's one right here. There's two, there's two, there's a okay. Okay. Isn't there one over there by, by the maintenance center? Oh, yeah. There's yeah, yeah, one at Public Works. Yeah, there's one at Public Works. You know, it, it, we have a map that shows the coverage area. Some are higher and have higher decibels. And the, the sirens are, uh, we have a, what we call a telemetry system. So every day they're growled remotely. And you, you couldn't hear it unless you're right underneath it, but it'll growl the siren and to assure that it's working. And they notify us if there's a problem, they come out and fix it. But I think it's, it might even be 14, but I think it's 11. And we have money in the budget for one more uh, down further south, but it, you know, wind conditions affect these sirens a lot. And every time we check it, it seems like we have enough coverage. And I think there's one at 135th in, uh, in Cherry by the water, near the water tower there that covers that area. There's one in the park at uh, um, 140th and uh, like Trenton in there, in that park. There's one there, but I can't think of the location of all of them. One by Jerry West. Yes. 151st now. Yeah, yeah, there's one there, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So if the thing goes off, you, you have to take cover. Somebody's spotted sure. the tornado. The, the three conditions, one of those conditions ha has been met. Okay. Now, Orland Park's a big town, so it may be that it was spotted south, and, you know, people north, they're gonna, the siren's going to go off there, too. And remember, it's seven or eight miles, which is a big, big distance, but that's fine. Yeah, but this, now, remember, with emergency sirens, there's no all clear. There's no such thing as an all clear. There's just the siren to seek shelter. And no all clear, that's you should be listening to your radios after that. Anything else? Yes, sir. Marie, uh, can we talk a little bit about traffic? Sure. Is that appropriate with this yeah. yeah. Uh, I know the village is uh, considering where to put uh, uh, red light cameras, uh, of which I've been an uh, outspoken opponent for many years. Uh, but the last few years I've noticed uh, the amount of what I see speeding on, on, on the road uh, that uh, and also uh, <coughs> besides the speedings that I see, I see we live on 157th Street, it's got a 20 mile an hour speed limit on it, I see people going 30, 35, we got the speed sign there at the uh, catchy park. By the park. Lights up on 35, I'm not just complaining about my area, I'm just saying in general, 
Is there any, I'm asking the question, is there any thought that they would use your speed cameras specifically in certain areas, either on a permanent basis or on a, uh, maybe a roaming basis? Speed cameras for tickets. They're, they're not legal other than in the city of Chicago by schools and parks. That's the only place that we get that question a lot, but they're only legal uh, next to schools and parks in the city of Chicago. One, just like the, um, the red light cameras are only legal in the five county area in and around Chicago and the two counties down by St. Louis, uh, St. Clair, Madison and St. Clair counties are the only places that they're legal. Now we, we have two cameras, red light cameras, one at 159th in Harlem southbound and another one at 151st in Harlem northbound. Those are the only two we have. And we, our policy, red light cameras were controversial because of the, specifically the right turns uh, that some municipalities were, if you didn't completely stop at the white line, they were issuing a ticket. We don't do that. A police officer has to look at everyone. If there's a pedestrian present, when you make that right turn and you don't stop, then we authorize the ticket. So or, or if you don't even slow down and go through it, we authorize the ticket. Otherwise, no. So every, every, every uh, questionable one is, is reviewed by a police <coughs> officer before it's, before it's issued for a ticket? Every single one is, has to be reviewed by a police officer before a ticket is authorized. So if a guy stops a foot past the line, but it's still a clear intersection, the most likely would not get a ticket. On a right turn? Yeah. Correct. They wouldn't get a ticket. But if, unless a pedestrian was present. Unless a pedestrian was present. Is there, is there reflectors on that little sign? It's reflective material. Mm -hmm. It's reflective material. Okay. But it, you know, after probably a couple seasons, they probably need some replacement. I, I noticed an incident uh, about a couple weeks ago uh, by the junior high over here on, uh, on 151st. Jerling. Just, yeah, just before the mall there. Uh, I thought there was going to be a big battle there because... Some guy had come across the street, he had a bunch of several kids with oh, him. Yeah. And there was a guy in the car yeah. on the, uh, he was not on the curb lane, he was on the, the inside of the you know, get up the center lane. And he started creeping up, and this guy stood there and he was going to yeah. challenge him. Yeah. The guy in the car didn't really know what it was all about, and I thought, oh my God. Yeah. There's a bit of road rage out there from time yeah, to time. Yeah. And, so, and some of it justified, don't get me wrong. But the pedestrian has a responsibility to be, uh, to be responsible also. Uh, not to just blindly step out there. Correct. Uh, without a doubt. Anything else? Thank you. Yes, sir. What's your attitude or what do you feel about having uh, weapons in the home for protection? Uh, I've never opposed. Oh, uh, the gentleman's uh, question was, my, how do I feel about people having weapons in their homes? And we have had that in the state of Illinois forever. Now we have concealed carry, but having an FOID card, uh, you know, so you've been screened, and having a weapon in your home is perfectly legal and, and certainly for the protection of your home. Uh, we have no problem with that whatsoever. Do you think it's a good idea? To have a weapon in your home? I think it's personal taste. Uh, I can tell you in Orland Park, I, in 20 years, I haven't seen a resident use one in the course of any crime, if, if that's of any help. Uh, I haven't seen anyone use one. Uh, you know, having a weapon, even trained police officers make mistakes with weapons under very stressful situations. So if you're not ever going to practice, go to a range, and that's target shooting. That, does, that just teaches how to put <coughs> holes in a target. It doesn't really tell you how to react if someone is coming into your home and what's legal and, and where the gray areas are. So. Uh, but I have no uh, problem with people having weapons in their home. I think what, what, what's happening is the older we feel more vulnerable, and how are we going to protect ourselves? I, I would rather not use a gun. Oh, thank you. Well, I, like I said, in 20 years here, I've never seen one of our residents use a weapon uh, during the commission of a crime at their home or at their residence. I, I haven't seen it happen. Uh, that's just a statistic, and you know, statistics, you know what they're worth sometimes. But you know, well-trained people having weapons in their home, it's perfectly legal, and it's a personal choice to do so. When you say well-trained, does that mean you have to go for practice and keep up with it? Or? Well, you'd if you own a weapon, you'd like to remain familiar with it, that you know how to use it when the time comes. You know where it's at, you know if it's loaded, not loaded, if there's a round in a chamber. Semi-automatic <coughs> pistols are different than revolvers. Rifles are different, too. So uh, 
even for police officers, we shoot at least four times a year just to maintain, you know, our prof our proficiency with them. So I would say citizens are probably a good idea if you're going to have a weapon to train with it from time to time. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. If there was something going out, they wanted you to register with your PIN number in the village. <coughs> so you had taken over some of your citizens' property without them. Not that I've ever heard of. Not that I've ever, I've never heard that. Uh, the young lady said that they, uh, when uh, many people own their property and that somehow or another people get the PIN number, which is public record, uh, and somehow through some type of scam try to take over their property. Yeah, it was in the area newspaper. Was it? Okay. I, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with it. Uh, yeah. I'm not familiar with it. Oh, okay. Just, uh, just a couple other things. So thank you for, for coming out with us this morning. Uh, we'll, we'll thank uh, the chief again for the coffee at the, at the last minute. And uh, as we start to close, we're, we're going to stay around for a few minutes. So if you'd like to have some other conversations, just, just find us. But you know, again, we can't emphasize strongly enough as you hear this information and you see this, make sure you tell family and friends so they know the same thing. A big piece of what we do well is keep track of what's going on so we can keep getting better at keeping this a, a, a safe area. And then just, a, just a, a simple question. The chief is preparing his budgets. We're in our budget cycle. The chief is preparing his budget, and just maybe by a show of hands or, or afterwards, give us some ideas. Is, is Trustee Calandrello, it works it through with the chief at his committee, and the board thinks about it. Our sense is you like strong, you like us to continue the kind of technology and personnel investments in the police department. Is, is that fair? Are we hearing that's right? Yes. Okay. So then the other question would be, as you've heard all of this stuff from the chief, right, there's, how do we get this to more people? So you heard about the weather spotters, you heard about the training we put our police department through. How do we share information best with more folks? Do we put it on a website? Do we hold more sessions like this? Can, can you give us some ideas on how best to communicate with you and your neighbors and your family? Sir? Well, that telephone information is good. Like if you have some yeah. outstanding... Uh, the phone call? Okay. Right, that's, that's very good there, I think. Okay. A any, any other ideas or comments or phone calls are good? Meetings like this? Yeah. Okay. We, we do a number of neighborhood beat or neighborhood watch meetings. We're gonna, we want to continue those. Are those helpful? You guys been to those? Okay. Ideas? Right. Maybe, maybe draw it in a little tighter to, to like an area of maybe four or five, six blocks. And just have a more neighborhood going in. Okay. You're talking about the police and the park program. The, the police and the park, right. Yeah, yeah the, the police and the park program. Right. Uh, what we do is we put out a code red to the area of, of that park, you know, within like a mile radius to let them know that it's, it's going on. Uh, the beat meetings are good too. Okay. So police in the park, beat meetings. Quick question. Um, we're trying to uh, make our Orland Park public more of an interesting publication to read. Is that a good vehicle for us to communicate with you, the Orland Park public, the one we send out quarterly? Okay. And then uh, one last question. A lot of folks nowadays like using email. Not everybody likes getting email. Not everybody likes sharing their email with a public entity. Is email effective or would be better off in the post office or the Orland Park public and, and get information that way? Yeah, just give me some ideas and preferences. You, li you like emails. Okay, we got one vote for email. Emails? Yeah, but not everybody has a computer though. Right, okay. So, so, so should, should we hear that we need to mix it up, maybe do both? The, the public in the mailbox and in the email box, okay? So if we came and asked, said, would you, in order to receive periodic updates from the village, can, may we have your email? Would most people be comfortable giving us their emails? Yes. Okay, so it's, it's mixed. I mean, we're not surprised. There are no surprise here. Not everybody's comfortable because then if we did do the emails, we have to be extremely careful that we never have a, a technical security breach. Everybody heard about what happened to Target where 70 million credit cards were leaked. Well, we want to we want to be sensitive to that. So we're just trying to look for any and all ways to make sure that you guys are fully informed about what we're doing. And quite frankly, you tell us what we should be doing. So if we're missing something, let us know because I don't think anybody here is shy, right? 
Okay? And, and then you know, to close, and again, thank you, but definitely make sure if something looks, um, what's the phrase now that the uh, National Security Administration uses on trains? If you see something, say something. Say something here, since we're so big, we're 22 square miles, which is a big town. You got to call us. And so whether it's 411 or 911, the chief won't mind extra phone calls. He really won't. I'll give you, I'll give you his desk number. <laughs> but, sir? Uh, officially, we're just uh, north of 61,000. Yeah, and by way of comparison, most people know the size of Oak Lawn, correct? Oak Lawn is about the same size and population as Orland Park, but it's only seven square miles. We're 22 square miles, so we're three times bigger geographically. So, you know, we, we've got the corner at 183rd and Will Cook all the way up to 135th. So we've, Chief has got a really big area to cover. And that's one of the reasons why we're so sensitive to making sure we've got the manpower, right? You want to have a cop car local for all the parts of the village. So we're, we're a pretty big geographic town. And then uh, we've got some, some of the Orland Park publics in the back as well. But so, so on behalf of Trustee Calandrello and myself and, and the Chief, thank you for being here. And thank you for all the, we got one more question. Sorry, sir. Damage, things like that. Yeah, so as well, we I talked to Village Paul uh, Grimes, who's not here. Paul Grimes, our village manager this morning. If it's a parkway tree, we will get around to addressing it. If you've got just some branches down, and most of us do, if you put them by the curb, waste management will pick it up as part of their normal, you know, recovery. If you've got a tree on private property, so basically between the curb and the rest of your lot, that one's on you because that's private property. We we can't go on it. Yeah, if it's in your backyard, if you can just find a way to get them broken up, you or your landscaper, if you got them to the curb on your regular waste pickup, waste management will take them. Okay. Is that helpful? But they also have to be under four foot. Yeah, waste management, uh, yeah, they, 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 they're not Paul Bunyan, so they're not going to want a big tree. So you got you to break it up for them. Sorry? <laughs> the trampoline? Yeah. Yeah, as I was driving in, I pulled over and, and took a picture of it. There's somebody's trampoline blue on top of the power lines on 104th Avenue near Great Eager Drive. So it makes for an interesting photo. So I sent the photo. So we've already told ComEd because we can't touch those lines. We don't want to touch power lines, right? And so that's coming, sir. Yeah, the, 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 I don't know if I, they're, yeah, the, it's not impossible to have it twice a year, just you know, manpower limitations of, of, of having the people available to do it, having the beat officer there. Uh, what we did, and you know, I think it's probably be easier because we've combined a couple of them uh, this year. We, we were, as I mentioned, we had a lot of retirees and so forth uh, this year, and we combined a couple of them. So we'll take it up, uh, our... Uh, uh, what we call our TQM meetings for the department, the total quality management meetings are coming up and I'll put it on the agenda. I want to go back and address something. I think the, the, the lady is gone in regards to tornado warnings and watch. Watch is favorable conditions and I think she was, uh, the National Weather Service will issue a tornado warning when a threat of a tornado is expected to affect an area, expected to an effect or is imminent or occurring. Now the issue is where? Where you know they've they've got it kind of all covered, and that's the issue. So she, her her definition, I think she was spot on pretty much, on her definition. But it it National Weather Service, uh, it, part of the definition she was spot on, uh, is expected to affect whatever that means. So that's why we have the people out there, uh, looking for them. Uh, that's why we have people looking at the radar and so forth. But I I assure you, it's not an exact science, and it's one of the toughest calls we make sitting there, looking at that. Okay. Stay here. All right, so um, again, uh, Trustee Calandrello, myself, and the Chief, we're going to stick around for a few minutes. We can't begin to thank you enough for your time. We apologize for the mood lighting and the fact that there was no air conditioning. But actually, it's kind of nice to go a little retro and have no air conditioning. Oh, thank you. No, appreciate it. Thank you. So, so we'll be here to take some questions, and by all means, give us a call if something comes up. You guys have a great morning.